Is it a bird? Is it a, p a duck? No, it's a frog. Wait, what? It's really a frog making all of that racket? Have you ever heard an amusing quacking noise coming from your pond? Heard sounds of something cheekily laughing at you, only to stop when you approach the water's edge? Have you been kept up at night time in the early summer with incessant sounds of quacking and hiccups? If so, then the chances are you've been invaded by a non-native species of amorous amphibian, the marsh frog. Marsh frogs, Pedophylax ridibundus, are Europe's largest species of frog, up to 50% larger than our native species, and typically it's found widespread around continental Europe and Western Asia. They're part of a wider group of amphibians, generally called green frogs, and this group includes the pool frog, native to the UK and considered very rare, the edible frog, and the marsh frog. Some distinguishing features of these large amphibians are their colour, which can vary from bilious green to olive and dark brown. Their overall size, particularly so the proportions of their head in relation to their body, which is very big. Their odd, for a frog in any case, inclination to sunbathe, and perhaps most notably, their very audible calls, a sound which can be described as quacking, laughing, or very much like a demented magpie who's taken something it probably shouldn't. It's difficult to determine exactly when or why these feisty frogs were introduced into the UK. Some records report deliberate introductions of green frogs into areas of Surrey in the late 1800s. And some of these introductions may well have included marsh frogs, but we can't be certain. However, we can be certain that a group of 12 marsh frogs were brought over from Hungary by a Mr Edward Percy Smith of Stone in Oxney in Kent during the winter of 34 to 1935 and released into his own garden pond for reasons unknown, but most likely for study. It didn't take long before these voracious amphibians bred and spread into nearby surrounding marshland, and by the 1960s, all of the neighbouring Romney Marsh was a cacophony of laughing and quacking. It was only a short hop from here into the neighbouring county of West Sussex, and over the decades, the march of the marsh frog has continued unabated occasionally having a helping hand by us humans. On one such occasion, infamously, a dedicated herpetologist keen to study these fanciful frogs in more depth introduced some marsh frogs into his suburban pond in Burgess Hill, West Sussex, one Friday afternoon, only to be served a noise complaint by the local council the very following Monday. Marsh frogs are particularly adaptable and they're able to thrive in areas where our native frog species would suffer such as areas with increased agricultural pollution or in brackish water, areas close to tidal water and estuaries. This makes the marsh frog a species that's now likely to stay with us for good and its numbers are surely going to increase further. Another interesting trait that marsh frogs have over our native frogs is their desire to actively seek out sunlight, preferring exposed, well-lit ponds and often sitting at the water's edge, legs and arms splayed out as if they were on holiday. In fact, these charming croakers lead a more aquatic life and seem almost territorial in maintaining their position in a pond, rather than our native frogs, which only tend to frequent water during spawning in early spring, then spend more time terrestrially in the undergrowth, only returning to water now and again until the winter, when they return to ponds, spending much of their time submersed to wait out the colder temperatures in a state of semi-hibernation. In all these years I've worked in and around ponds locally, never encountered a marsh frog until now and that's because I've got two of these noisy buggers in my own pond. Let me introduce you to Bertie and Bob. Right, I'm coming to my pond to see if I can catch either Bertie or Bob in their usual positions. Now Bertie, the one we've had in the pond for a lot longer, tends to be quite reliable in the position. Ah, there we go, look. Sunbathing, although she's in shade. And I say she, because I'm pretty sure that's a female. There she is, sitting at the side of the pond. And she tends to either sit there, she likes to be in the undergrowth just behind, 
or she'll swing around and float around here just underneath the aces. But reliably, she's always in one of those positions. Never work with animals, so let's hope this one plays ball. But in general, she's quite gregarious and doesn't seem to get too bothered by people. She'll be bobbing around in the pond and a kid's football will land in the water and she won't move, she'll carry on just bobbing around. And I've got to the, to the state now where I can sort of lob a couple of worms. And if I'm lucky enough to get one close to her on the side, she'll eat it. I'll even have one dangling on the end of a stick and she's taken that as well. Bob, on the other hand, much smaller, is nowhere near as, as sort of tame as this one. And as soon as there's any sight of someone near the pond, will disappear. But uh, Bertie, and I have to say, this is not my name, this is my wife's. I would have chosen something much more masculine, like Bob. But Bertie, we've had since a tiny little froglet. About two years ago was the first time we noticed it. And obviously as a new pond, I was quite excited at the prospect of having any amphibians that were arriving at the pond, you know, on their own free will. Uh, and it would always sit in the same spot, just a little hole here on the side of the pond when it was very small to do so. And then as it progressively got bigger and bigger and bigger and it got too big to sit in there, it would then sit on the overflow. And hilariously now, obviously, it's much, much bigger. She'll still try and sit on the overflow. And I've got some photos of that. And, you know, successfully she does do so, but she's sort of sprawled out all over it. So I'm going to see if I can offer her a worm. Let's see if she'll take it. She's just turned her back on me. So it's probably thinking about disappearing off into the undergrowth. So let me see if I can tempt her with a worm. I need a good throw here. Oh yes. Sorry wormy, but this is all in the name of natural history. Go on Bertie. The frogs are a, are a sight predator. They've got very, very good eyesight. And they're drawn to movement. There you go. Yep, she's got it. Now, I'm going to see if I can actually grab her. I have handled it before a couple of times. I don't like doing it too often because I don't want to, to scare her and I don't want to stop her from being quite as, as bold as she is. Oh, now she's eating the worm. Got her, that was a good time. And the worm is still in her mouth, look. Cheeky thing. Look at the underside of this. Very pale, mottled, a little bit different to our native frog. She's not fully grown yet. Still has a bit of growth to go, but already she's as big or maybe a tiny bit bigger than our common frog. Very cute face, haven't you, eh? Let's pop her in the tub. Oh! I didn't last long. She was out of the tub very quickly and I won't try and handle her again. But there she is. At least she finished a worm. Go on, in the water, keep going. There you go. Oh, I think that's the end of that for, for the rest of today. But I'm pleased that she was playing ball and I was able to handle her. Now, understandably, there's a little bit of concern about what the impact might be of non-native species on our native amphibians. This concerns that perhaps marsh frogs being a much larger variety uh, might outcompete for space and for food. There's potential that they could be a vector for disease um, with amphibians. Um, but at the moment, so far, everything seems to be inconclusive and no studies have really shown that there is a direct um, concern with marsh frogs and our native common frogs. In fact, marsh frogs tend to frequent areas where common frogs don't like. Marsh frogs will quite happily frequent salty brackish conditions, so 
waterways close to tidal estuaries where our common frog won't. Um, and they prefer to have much sunnier, brighter ponds, which again, our common frogs tend not to because the marsh frog likes to sit out of the pond and likes to, to sunbathe. So at the moment, there's not really any concerns, I think, other than that noise. Now, I had fears originally that maybe I'd introduced the frog accidentally in moving plants around, because I do do a lot of work in the sort of West Sussex area, which is a lot closer to, to the area where the, the frogs are becoming more common. Um, but I've discovered that in a village close by, a couple of miles away, there's a lot of ponds that I've seen and heard as I've gone past, absolutely filled with them. So I don't think I've introduced it inadvertently. I think they are around, and I think that it's just taken up residence in this pond. I'll tolerate one. I'll tolerate a second one whilst I've got them, but there's no way in heck I would want them breeding in here. Um, I have taken advice from an ecologist to find out what I could do about it. Obviously, I don't want to be moving non-native, potentially invasive species around into different pools and waterways. Uh, and the advice I've been given is that if there are other ponds that I know locally that have them, that if it becomes a problem, you know, I'm in quite a built up residential area here. I've got neighbors. These are very, very noisy. Uh, then I've got somewhere that I could move it if needs be. I hope it doesn't come to that because I'm quite fond of her. It's nice. I come to the pond and have a cup of tea and have a look and she'll always be somewhere reliably. So I hope we get to, to hang on to it. As you can see, if you've been keeping up to date with any of the videos about my own pond build, which this is, I haven't finished it yet. Bit by bit, I've done little bits and pieces. The next stage for me is to build the second water blade. I'm very close to doing that and I really need to pull my finger out and crack on and do it. And then once that's done, there's just a little bit of walling to do and then it's the paving and then it's job done. But I am struggling to, to find time and to get motivated to finish it off. I did recently construct these little frames of netting. The heron has been an issue now and again. I didn't want to net the pond entirely because I don't want to prevent dragonflies and beetles and birds having access to the water. So I'm covering about 70% of it. And the idea is that when I want to enjoy the pond without it, I can just remove these two grids and store them for the day and then put them back over. I've used copper piping for this uh, and then just glued rather than welded uh, all of the push fit joints um, very unprofessionally by hand kind of bent all of the copper piping to just match the shape of the, the pond, the curve of the pond and the stepping stone. And actually, even without a pipe mender, it doesn't look half bad, so I'm quite happy with that. And there's a good example of why I don't want to net the pond entirely. Because I've got a lovely dragonfly just hovering over the pond now. You know, it's natural wildlife like this that I really want to actively encourage. The fish are a bonus. But they're not the most important thing. Look at that, beautiful. Come on then you. Come on. He's finally got brave enough to go over the stepping stone, silly boy. He hates water. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the story of the marsh frog. As I say, if you haven't encountered one yet, the chances are that in the not too distant future, you will see one. Thanks very much for watching. I'm Ed from Crystal Clear Aquatics. This is Digby. I'll see you in the next pond. Thanks. Come on then, you can do it. <laughs>